industries. Um, and one of them would acquire, was acquired by the Tennyson Research Center in, in 2015. So to keep this sort of thing accessible to the public, we need to help Lincoln County Council recruit a decent archivist. So if anyone gets a chance, please, please share that link. So what I'm, I'm going to talk about today, um, it's going to be quite a focused talk because it's about one book. It's a short book. There's basically nine illustrations um, with some text excerpts. Um, it's not very well known at all. There are no digitized copies anywhere. There's only a few copies kicking around libraries in the world. So I'm going to show you images of the entire book. And because I have quite a, a, a highly um, aware Tennyson audience I'm talking to, and I've been reading pieces written by a lot of the people in the audience um, recently in the, in the last few days, and many of the Tennyson talks already have talked a lot about Tennyson's poem, The Princess, and also the reception of The Princess. So I'm genuinely interested to hear your comments today on the, the visualizations of this text that I'm going to show you. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, um, run through some basic facts, run through some contexts about this book, then show you images of the book itself. I'm then going to suggest, you know, three or four different lines of analysis, as it were. Um, I've done quite a lot of looking at the primary source. I haven't waded right through the secondary literature yet, so I haven't really connected this to the literary criticism in a detailed way. Um, so some of that part might be might be absent and there's more to work on um but i'll be very interested to hear what what you think and uh how that fits with what conclusions i've come to so far okay so so the basic facts um the book as it looks um when closed you can see top right there um it was advertised in december 1850 at two pounds two shillings i.e two guineas with a cloth cover um that's expensive it's huge it's royal folio size so it's 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 a great big book um this is not a book you could read on a train or even really carry around with you it's really only the sort of book you could only open in front of you on a table um there are eight full page illustrations with quotations plus a title page and a frontispiece, but that's the extent of, of the book. So it's quite a thin book. And I'll be talking more about the format later, but it's really closer to a bound portfolio, portfolio than an illustrated book. Um, now the different textual versions of the princess, uh, most of us know there's quite a complicated sort of evolution and genesis of the poem. Um, it's quite difficult to determine exactly which edition um, the artist used. Um, the quotations are chosen from passages that did not vary between the first, second and third editions. So Mrs. Lease, Mrs. S.C. Lease could have used either of these editions. Um, it was the third edition of 1850, of course, that was radically revised, including the weird seizures, the, the added lyrics. Um, my instinct is um, that she was using one, the first or, or second edition. And if we look at the timing, um, because I've done this in my previous research, I can give you the geeky dates. So the third edition was advertised in November 1849. The print run ordered in late January 1850. Now, given this book was actually being sold in December 1850, I think that makes the timeline a little bit tight for the author to be using the third edition. And yet it is possible, but I'm afraid that remains ambiguous. OK, so the first thing I want to do is um, think about this book, if you like, in a within a chronology of Tennyson illustrations. A lot of the scholarly discourse about illustrating Tennyson really kicks off with the so-called Moxon Tennyson, which was designed for the Christmas gift book market in 1856, but actually published in 1857. Um, this, the Moxon Tennyson was the first time Tennyson's publisher, Edward Moxon, had actually published an illustrated version of his poet. But 
a lesser known story is that at least six publications carried Tennyson illustrations before this date. So we might want to ask ourselves what's actually going on here. The first ever Tennyson illustration I found is that one in the top left. It's um, um, it's a strange book. It's um, the Book of Gems. It's an anthology edited by Samuel Carter Hall, 1838. Um, you can see Tennyson's little known poem, Bonaparte, illustrated by an engraving from Hayden. And it's a very weird combination because Hayden thought Napoleon was fantastic. Tennyson hated him. So it's one of those classic real mismatches between the image and, um, and the poem. And of course, it wasn't specially made. But apart from that, that is the only illustration I've so far found before this book. So the thing I want to stress really is how early this book is in the history of Tennyson illustrations. So it's a great, big, bold, ambitious book that so far isn't on the map at all when we're talking about the illustration history of, of Tennyson. Um, we might ask ourselves what, what's going on. So um, Moxon's been quite slow off the mark. He's been publishing Tennyson for a while, but has failed to produce an illustrated edition. And it's really with the so-called Mox and Tennyson that he cottons on and thinks, blimey, I could be making some money out of this. Now that all goes wrong, and but that, that's another story. Um, what I think probably happened with these early illustrated editions is people just wrote to Tennyson and asked him a favour. Can I, can I use a quotation from your text to put by an illustration? Or can I use quotations from your poem to you know, preface um, illustrations in the book. So I think a lot of these things were favours. Some of these books had vaguely charitable um, options. So there's this kind of activity going on beneath Tennyson's official publisher. And this is the most spectacular example of what we're talking about. So it's the first ambitious illustrated publication relating to Tennyson's poetry. It's a rare book. And you know, it makes me sad to think because it signals kind of days gone by, really. I, I found a copy of, second-hand copy of this book in an Italian bookseller, and I forwarded the link to Grace Timmins, who was then collections officer for the Tenson Research Centre. About six weeks later, she phoned me up and says, guess what's just arrived? And in those days, the Tennyson Research Centre actually had an acquisitions budget. And she asked for the money, she got it, and the book arrived. So that just shows kind of the value of a well-funded archive. OK, another context. Let's think about what how people would have perceived Tennyson at the time this book was published. So it's published December 1850. So I've just pasted in here a kind of graph from my, my last book. And um, I hope you can see the, the, the key there is slightly um, blocked out by, by the images I've got on my screen. But basically, um, the bottom colour, the light green, is, is the 1842 poems. Then the more yellowy green is the princess. Then the blue is in memoriam and then moored in purple. So you can see in any given year roughly how many copies of each book sold. If you look for the column of 1850, you'll see by that year that the dominant book is in memoriam. So that was the year in memoriam was published. So Tennyson's big publication that year is in memoriam. You can see that year and the two previous years, um, the princess makes a significant proportion of Tennyson's sales, but underneath that all the time is the 1842 poems. So I think this gives you a sense, although I'm talking about, right, this illustrated edition of Tennyson in 1850, um, but the princess wouldn't have been the, the main poem in people's minds when you said Tennyson um, at, at this time. The other thing to remember is that Tennyson's appointment as poet laureate was kind of hit the print media in November 1850. Um, this too might have influenced responses to, to Mrs. Lee's book because Tennyson had was in the process of being adopted as the national poet. And I think this coloured some responses to the book I'm going to be talking about today. OK, the artist. This is probably the biggest failing of my research to date. Um, Mrs. S.C. Lease is an artist totally unknown to current academic discourse. 
which is not listed in dictionaries of Victorian artists and dictionaries of book illustration, dictionary of national biography, illustration databases. Her name doesn't come up, come up at all. Um, she's not mentioned at all in studies by really good scholars of Tennysonian illustration. I'm thinking Lorraine Carustra, Julia Thomas. Um, and her name first appears, the first mention of her name at all I can find, is in the newspapers as the illustrator of Voices of the Night, Longfellow's poem. So she illustrated an edition of this in August 1850. And the title was Voices of the Night by Longfellow with illustrations by a lady. So at that point, she's kind of presenting herself as anonymous, um, also published by the same publisher, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, when you re re read reviews of both publishers, um, they just talk about the book. They don't seem to know anything about the artist beyond the book. Um, but the evolution of um, calling herself a lady um, to Mrs. S.C. Lees suggests um, an artist with professional ambition. And as I will explain later, the nature of the image suggests artistic training and indeed research. These are not naive Im images, and I'll show later how they're connected to some of the developments in pre-Raphaelite drawing. Okay, now the publisher, um, this too is, is significant. The publisher is Dickinson Brothers. Now, they're probably best known now as the publishers of the spectacular set of chromolithographs of the interiors of the Crystal Palace, the Great Exhibition 1851. So I've given you one there, the North Transept of the Crystal Palace waiting for the Queen. That's one of a big set that became very, very famous. They basically, um, they jump on lithography and chromolithography. Um, so chromolithography, colour lithography, is quite new although technically the process had been invented um, several decades earlier, it's only really in the 1850s that it becomes viable to start publishing big commercial chromolithographs. So we've got an early process, early technological process involved in this book as well. Um, they also produce quite topical publications. So that one, of course, hot off the press straight after the Great ex Exhibition. But there's another example there. Um, the first Russian prisoners from Scutari and its hospitals. So this is part of the sort of medical reform discourse following the Crimean War. But you can see there, 1855, quite topical. So produced, you know, published quite um, hot on the heels of topical events. There's also a personal connection here, which may have something to do with the genesis of this book. Um, one of the Dickens brothers was Lowe's Cato Dickinson, 1819 to 1908. He was a successful portraitist with a deep reverence for, for Tennyson. He worked on a book in the same format as illustrations to the princess. So you can see on the right there, a Spanish lady's love. This is a traditional ballad illustrated in this case by an aristocratic lady, La Re Lady Dalmini. And you can see there, probably just see drawn on stone by Lowe's Dickinson, i.e. Um, Lowe's Katie Dickinson did the lithography. So this kind of large format, um, big chrome, um, lithograph book is obviously a specialist in Dickinson Brothers. Now, Lowe's Katie Dickinson, he worked for his father's lithography firm from 1835 to 50. He's a partner from 1849. We know he's studying in Italy in the early 1850s. But 1854, he's back and he's co-founder of the Working Man's College, a collaboration with John Ruskin, Thomas Hughes, Dante Gabriel Rossetti. So... He's not just a printer, he's actually interacting with some of the really big names today um, and involved in this kind of philanthropic educational project with Ruskin, Hughes, Rossetti. Um, and you can see there on the bottom right, a portrait of Charles Kingsley, 1862. Now we know he knows Tennyson. He wrote to Tennyson in 1886, consoling him about his son Lionel's death. In 1892, he's staying close to Oldworth, Tennyson's house, and asks if he might call. He says, I can hardly hope you will remember me for many years have passed away since as a modest occasional visitor to Little Holland House, I had sometimes the honour and great pleasure of meeting you. So here, Lowe's Cato Dickinson was getting entrance to the parties given by Julia Margaret Cameron's sister. This is where the kind of literati kind of met um, in the 1850s and 60s. 
he obviously kind of met Tennyson a couple of times there, but didn't feel he'd met him enough to, to be remembered. Um, but he obviously um, is given permission to call because in the Tennyson Research Centre as well, there's a pencil portrait of Tennyson signed LDC and the dedication to Lady Tennyson in memory of days at Aldworth. And this is after, after Tennyson's death. So we've got someone who was obviously a great admirer of Tennyson. He is part of the publishing house that publishes this book. So there's some sort of connection there that I haven't quite got to the bottom of, but is very suggestive of why this book was published in the first place. OK, so the actual content of the book. Um, I'm just going to show you, there we go, three slides. So this is the entire content of the book we're looking at. I thought, hey, you won't have seen this online, so I might as well show you the entire content. As you can see, we've got quite a kind of distinctive format throughout the illustrations. We have a big monochrome lithograph, um, so line drawing in black and white forming the main part of the image. And this is surrounded by an elaborate frame, normally with figures on the top, sometimes with heraldic motifs. Um, the frame decorated often with tendrils of very naturalistically drawn fruit. And along the bottom, we have quotations from the princess itself. So it's only these, the only text in the book is the quotations along the bottom of the illustrations. So this isn't an illustrated edition. It's a series of images taking off from quotations selected from the poem. So it's a different type of format. The exception you can see on the left is the frontispiece. This is a, a portrait of the princess herself, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, now, one of the things we might be interested in, and we're always interested in when we're studying book illustration, is which things does the artist choose to illustrate? Because that process of selection is obviously pretty fundamental to the whole process. So, illustration one, The Ambassadors. This is um, book one, and it's not a massive part of the narrative, and I'll talk a bit more about, about this later. But this is the passage where um, the, the prince has been, since a child, bet betrothed to the princess, and they send ambassadors off to the other king to, to get word on what's happening. And this is what we're looking at in the scene. Um, the next image, quite a, jump, uh, quite a jump. So this is the gardens of the Women's College. This, of course, is the, the Women's College founded by Princess Ida. Um, men are not, not allowed inside. And this is the vision that the prince and his two fellow men in disguise are looking at. I'll come back to these later. Um, the next image also in the, in the gardens of the, the Women's College, but notably linked to the lines where Princess Ida, you can see towards the top left of the image, this is image three, um, is, is, is toying with a leopard at her feet. And the image of the leopard is quite interesting, I think within the poem. Again, you can see these sort of trellis frameworks and these figures sort of interacting with what's going on in the main screen. Um, next image, um, central to the narrative. So after, um, after the men in drag are discovered as men, because one of them sings a bawdy song, um, the women leave either riding her horse over a bridge, falls into the river, and is then sa saved by the prince. So this is the prince hauling Ida out of the river via a, a branch that, that's in the river. The next scene is Psyche in the, in the king's camp. So we can see how she's the figure down. She is one of Princess Ida's kind of um, lieutenants, as it were. Um, and this is her in, in the king's camp. This is, if you like, kind of romantic subplot. She is the sister of Florian, one of the characters. Played. And the last three images, um, um, knights in shining armor. So the prince is wounded by the princess's brother, Arak. So we're, we're looking at that, that moment there on the left. Then the next moment, that's the prince being cradled by his father. 
and the princess looking on. And this bit's significant because it's the moment at which the hard attitude of the princess starts to soften. So it's one of the kind of turning points of the romantic plot. And on the right, the prince proposes, the lines quoted here are more or less the last lines of the main narrative. So if you like, this is the denouement of the kind of romance plot where the prince proposes to the princess. And she seems to acquiesce, although this, we might say, is ambiguous. Okay, so that I hope has given you a sense of what we're looking at in terms of the, the total content of the book. What I'm now going to do is suggest some ways in which we might want to think about this in terms of, of analysis. Um, this book is something of an oddity. Like I say, it, it's a strange thing to call a book because it's so big and so thin. Um, it's more like a bound portfolio. Um, but in one review of Lisa's book, um, The Morning Chronicle celebrates the kind of luxury of this publication. So I'll read this out. The munificent spirit of the English in relation to art is signally shown in the patronage afforded to expensively illustrated books. No expense seems too great for those who prepare such works for the general public. No price is too high for the wealthy connoisseurs, provided the book offered be of the superior class. Nowhere are so much money and skill spent on this class of mental luxuries as in London. So <laughs> that's proposal one. This is a mental luxury, apparently. And it's a slightly strange kind of approach, that, isn't it? But there's a sort of pride in the opulence of these sort of illustrated books, the scale, um, increasingly the colour. Um, I found one other copy, so the... the you could get alternate covers. So the one on the left there, this is currently for sale in Tokyo um, for about $700, I think. Anyway, that's green velvet with a kind of brass clasp. So you can see some of them got more elaborate. Now, what we're in the, what's in the process of happening in the 1850s is a sort of transition between different formats of illustrated book. Um, Lorraine Coistra's book, Poetry, Pictures and Popular Publishing, the Illustrated Gift Book and Victorian Visual Culture, um, is centred on what's often called the classic period of Victorian book illustration, i.e. wood engraved Christmas gift books from the 1860s. Um, um, Coistra spends quite a lot of time um, analysing the non-literary content of poetic gift books. She looks at paratext, context pages, illustration lists, looks at the kind of complex production and, and promotion of the books, and sees it as a kind of new type of cultural form, although illustrated books had been around before. She talks about the transition of the literary annuals of the Romantic period, like the Keepsake, Forget-Me-Not, she says, if annuals gave access to fine art in the form of reproduced paintings, the wood engraved poetic gift book permitted ownership of an original artwork that straddled the borders of high art and mass production. And what she's basically arguing is because the artworks were commissioned specifically for the books, anyone buying the book got an original artwork. But the contradiction to that, of course, is these were mass produced books. So you got an original artwork, but actually other people have got it too. So there's that sort of contradiction between mass production, mass readership, and these specially commissioned works of art. Now, looking at this book, looking at illustrations to the princess, it shares this hybrid form to some extent, but it's, it's physically very different. We've got fewer pages in a much larger format. It's twice the price. Your standard price for a Christmas gift book was, was a guinea or 21 shillings, whereas this book is twice the price. The format also gives the artist more editorial power. You're not given a text which you illustrate at certain moments. You, of course, select a moment and give a bit of text. So in effect, if you're just working from the publication, that's all you've got. So you only get what the artist gives you in a way. So it's a different sort of proposition. And actually, I think it's closer to Julia Margaret Cameron's photographically illustrated editions of Idols of the King from the 1870s than the, 19, than the 1860s 
illustrated gift book. So um, Cameron was quite idiosyncratic too in her use of Tennyson. Um, she wrote out Tennyson's poetry in her own handwriting. There's kind of quite a assertion of her own identity with it. And those, I think, in many ways are more comparable to what we're looking at with, with Lisa's illustrations to the princess than the gift books. Another format we might look at is the personal amateur album. Um, this came to mind because um, Hannah Field wrote an interesting article about some of the manuscript albums by amateur artists in the illustri in the Tennyson Research Centre. And her approach to these books is treating them as supplements to reader experience studies. So many of you literary scholars in the audience will know about sort of reader experience databases where we might get a diary entry of what people are reading possibly how they felt about it. Um, Hannah Field argues that visual responses in these sort of albums constitute sustained interpretive responses to Tennyson's poems and should be thought of as responses. And I'd quite like to hear what, what some of you think about visualisations of poetry being akin, if you like, to reader experience surveys. Field also talks about um, these books being a particularly important resource when the readers in question were women and the texts they illustrated were about women. And this, of course, is the case with Mrs. S.C. Lee's illustrations to the princess. So obviously we've got a contrast here. Um, illustrations to the princess is not private, but it's a commercial publication intended for a public audience. Though Lise might have identified as an, as an amateur in her previous publication. But like the albums, I think it's a sustained and individualistic response to the poem and aligned to Lise's own interpretation of the poem. Just as a sort of visual equivalent here, there's an album here probably from the 1860s. But this combines um, a kind of version of J.E. Millet's The Prescribed Royalist from 1853 with excerpts sort of hand illuminated from the Spender Falls on Castle Walls. So that shows you, I mean, people are talking about these things as kind of fandom now in the way it's not quite fan culture, but it gives you this sense of people creatively responding to the poetry in visual ways. Okay, so let's think now about some of the choices that Mrs. Leith made. Um, so in terms of the style, there's eclectic modes of imagery. There's orientalist images like the dark skinned figure you can see in the top right. There's medievalist images. You can see that in the armor. You can see that in that in the knight's um, armor in the bottom right there. Um, there are also classicist imagery. You can see in the middle there, that's an altar of Hymen with some um, Greek um, honeysuckle motifs upon it. And we've got extensive naturalistic imagery in the borders. When we think about what she selected to illustrate, um, there's nothing of the frame narrative. So as most of you will know, the princess is framed by a modern narrative. It starts off in a sort of um, public day in a country estate, modern audience talking about the past and then they tell each other stories and that's the main narrative. There's no sign of that frame narrative in Lisa's book. Um, there's also strong elements of comedy, satire, burlesque, um, the lads dressing up as women and sneaking into the women's college, these sort of elements that, that are so hard to kind of understand in terms of tone, but there's no hint of that here. There's none of those comedic em um, emphasis. So the emphasis in the book is on the romantic plot quite straight and it excludes all these extraneous things that for some readers and critics now make, make the poem quite um, hard to understand or, or, or ambiguous. Okay, so there's some big choices. Now I'm gonna look at a few different frameworks and the first one is art historical. And this is interesting because, you know, I think there's a certain conservatism about the about how Lise reads the poem, but the mode of representation is actually quite avant-garde. Several critics associated Lise's style 
with the German artist Moritz Fretsch. Um, the Athenaeum talks about the manner of Fretsch. Uh, Art Journal talks about German formality. Uh, Morning Chronicle talks about Fretsch like power. So Fretsch is basically um, an illustrator. He's German. He's particularly noted for illustrating German romantic authors, Goethe, Schiller. And his outlines to Shakespeare was published simultaneously in Germany and in the UK in 1828 and was very, very influential. His style emphasizes austere outline and linearity. And this is quite interesting at the time because it's very much against the grain. What you would be taught in the Royal Academy is tonal drawing, modeling, volume, texture, shadow. Um, that's the antithesis of this quite stark linear outline style drawing. Um, so we've got a very strong um, influence from this German romantic illustrator. Um, one thing I've just come across, I haven't got a positive connection here, but Henry Crabb Robinson, who's a friend of Samuel Rogers, who's a patron of both Moxon and Ten Tennyson. Robinson was a champion of Wretch, um, and particularly his illustrations to Goethe, he was kind of promoting these. So I'm wondering about, was Robinson somehow an influence in the publication we're talking about? It's just a question I'm wondering. But we know Wretch was a big influence on Byron and Shelley, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, J.E. Millet, and William Holman Hunt. So we have um, a source of illustrative style who is very much influencing the, the artistic avant-garde at the time and is strongly associated with Reese, with Mrs. Least. So, I mean, what are the similarities? Well, suppose, so we're looking at uh, Moritz Rech, um illustration on your right. This is Romeo and Juliet. Um, I suppose the most obvious thing is the figures in the foreground have a thicker outline. And if you look at the scenes in the background, you get fainter lines. Now, this is a very marked motif in Lisa's images. You can see her here on the left in the um, kind of proposal, the last image. We've got quite a strong dark outline of the prince and princess in the foreground. And the background is signified by the kind of fainter line. So we've got this kind of sp um, spatial recession indicated through how strong the lines are. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about this is people have argued that the austerity of this style allows space for the reader to impose their own imaginative response on the text. So that suggestion possibly I think is quite intriguing to um, flesh this out in a bit more detail. Colin Cruz, who's a, a great historian, particularly um, fantastic exhibition of pre-Raphaelite drawing in about 2011. Cruz associates outline style with a reaction against academic painting, with the early manner of artists like J.E. Millet and William Holman Hunt. And I'm reading this quote, this reduction of pictorial means stimulated the viewer's imagination. Outline encouraged the viewer to develop a new and heightened imaginative relationship with the engraved illustration. The viewer's role in both deciphering spatial relationships and reading nuances of feeling was acute. So Cruz is saying, yeah, we give you less, but that invites the viewer to imagine more. So that would associate this style with quite a deliberate artistic strategy. Now. Interestingly, there's another comment within the criticism of Lisa's work that points towards the same thing. Now, this critic is actually being in the Morning Post, is actually being negative about the book, but points out, and I'm quoting here on the bottom, Mrs. Lee also seems herself to have some doubt as to her power of depicting the human face. For whenever it is possible, we find the characters turning their backs to the spectator. Now, that's not really true of all the images, but it is a fair point. So if you look at the image on your right, this is, again, the princess being saved from the river by the prince. All the figures there are facing away from the viewer. Now, what interests me here, and I've yet to substantiate this link, is this is a marked feature of one of the, the very great German romantic painters, Caspar David Friedrich. 
I've got two famous examples there. Wander above a sea of fog, 1818, and on the right, the top man and woman contemplating the moon. Here the figures have their backs to us. And when art historians are writing about Friedrich, they're not looking at this. They're not saying, oh, Friedrich can't paint a face and the figures have got their backs to us. Um, they're taking it, I think, for what it is. So when we look at the wander above a sea of fog, if he was facing us, we'd be thinking, right, how's he reacting to the sea of fog? But with his back to us, it's almost positioning the viewer as the person experiencing that. Again, it's projecting the viewer, stimulating the viewer into a direct imaginative experience. So, you know, this makes me think, right, Mrs. Lees, she's got connections with German romantic illustrators. We have images where many of the figures are facing away from the author. Is perhaps she also looking at German romantic painting, particularly Friedrich? This is something I'm interested in pursuing. Um, the borders and images. This is something picked up on by just about all um, all the critics. So we've got decorative scroll work borders or vignettes, marked feature of the book, you can't miss them. Why? Well, this is where the chromolithograph comes in. This is the colour element. So they really stick out. So the monochrome images within the colour frames is quite an unusual feature. I would argue these frames function in several different ways in the volume. They're used as a framing device. They contain symbolic content underlining the illustrations. And at times, they're structural markers about developments in the narrative. Um, so, for instance, you look at the, the figure on the right. Again, we've seen a lot of this one, but this is the, 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 the prince pulling the princess out of the water. If you look at the figure above, there's a, there's a detail there above left. The figure's looking down, so that's kind of bouncing the viewer down. She's also kind of hanging on to a branch, almost like she's in the scene in the image. Um, we've got a, a trailing plant there. I think that's probably a dog rose, so that's probably some sort of signifier that we're in the love plot. And mainly, maybe something about wildness. It's quite difficult to work out exactly um, how the naturalistic elements relate. Sometimes they're very clear. Sometimes it's a little bit vaguer. Um, almost all the critics noted the, the elaborate borders. And several even went as far as to question whether Lise was responsible for both. So this is a very handsome folio for a drawing room table. The illuminated borders are remarkably beautiful and equal to any specimens of that sort of decoration we have seen. Um, this very gorgeous work is remarkable, first for the exquisite beauty of the ornamental decorations at the head and in parts surrounding each plate. We do not remember to have seen anything more charming. We do not know if we are right in supposing these borders to be by some other hand than that to which are due the subjects that the former enclose. So that's the upper name, you know, did Mrs. Lee actually do the borders as well? And the art journal, we should almost think this portion of the work is from the hand of someone well skilled in the art of chromolithography, and that it has been added to Mrs. Lee's designs after she had drawn them on the stone. Um, I don't know. We don't know enough about the book to know whether they are done by someone different. I think um, at the very least, there was a consultation between whoever did the chromolithography. Um, so I think she at least designed them because they're too integrated with the main illustrations, as I will go on to show. So here I'm looking at, um, we have on the left, we have illustration five. This is Psyche in the King's Camp. And on the right, um, illustration eight, the proposal. You will see that both images are topped by um, images associated with the altar of Hymen. Um, I think what's going on here is on the left, you'll see the lamp, one of the motifs around the kind of Cupid and the altar of Hymen, obviously it's about marriage. Um, the lamp on the left is either going out or there's a kind of red flame, it's kind of smoking, it's not fully lit. And this is signifying, if you like, I think the faltering love plot. On the right, in this sort of proposal scene, the fire is a light on the altar and all seems well, as it were. But you'll see beneath also within um, illustration eight, 
um, in the top left hand corner, we've also got a weeping Cupid that sort of echoes that, that image in the top. And those two images are so closely connected that the idea that these were done by different people is, I don't think, ultimately tenable. In order to pick up, if you like, on, on the symbolism of the naturalistic motifs and what's in the image, you'll see on the right, we have two pairs of lovebirds in the corner. And the plant around the edge is, of course, a passion flower. So there's lots of kind of clear symbolism linking the naturalistic elements of the border to the main to the main image. When we think about this image, the altar of Hymen in the text, it's it's rather interesting. Um, the only point it's mentioned, as far as I can see, is just after the prince has sung "O Swallow, Swallow," one of the lyrics. Um, and Ida reacts in a very negative way. I would this same mock love and this mock hymen were laid up like winter bats till all men grow to rate us at our worth. So it's interesting. The word is actually used just at a turning point in the poem, because, of course, this is just before um, the prince's um, one of the other blokes sings a bawdy song when they're discovered so it's just at a turning point in the poem and we've got a kind of repeated imagery throughout throughout the illustration so um i don't think the borders are incidental i think there's a scheme i think there's a kind of structural logic to to not only how the borders relate to the illustration underneath but how they actually progress through the work itself okay um where are we doing for time? Okay, just about another um, five, five, ten minutes. Now, one of the things that's interesting here, I think, is I, there's a sort of ambivalence, I think, because um, this publication seems to be endorsing the, the main romance plot. Um, and this, of course, if you're reading the poem, is where the kind of fiery feminist logic of Ida in the main sections of the poem is watered down into what comes to be seen like a very, very conventional kind of um, understanding of gender relations in the mid 19th century, i.e. the women's college becomes a hospital, um, the women fall in love with the men, and just at the end, um, we don't uh, we don't get a formal marriage, but we certainly get the prince proposing to the princess. It seems to be kind of evolving into a very conventional story. Um, but there's also quite an insistent emphasis throughout this book, despite, if you like, being complicit in endorsing that plot, in depicting Ida as a heroine. I was asking myself a lot over the last few weeks, why include this image of the ambassadors? It's not the most obvious thing to include. You know, there are much more kind of um, exciting narrative choices in book one. If you look at other versions of the princess, you know, the escape of Florian, so rather than the prince from the from the kingdom, the interview with Ida's father, the journey to the women's college. These are all things that you'd expect to be more obvious choices. But we get this passage. Now, just occurred to me, did she include it because it allowed her to include the bit that signal Ida's autonomy? You see that last stanza on the right, but then she had a will, was he to blame, and maiden fancies love to live alone among her women, certain she would not wed. You know, maybe this was included because she got to include the line, because she had a will, and this was central to her understanding of the poem. Another hint that Mrs. Lease very much favours um, Ida as an authentic heroine is the frontispiece. Um, it makes Ida central to the visual language of the book. It's the most elaborate border. We have a kind of finial of a lily ranked by a rosebud. I'm not quite sure what the floral motif on the right is. It's another kind of bud. But lily, lily signaling purity, rose signaling love. These are all kind of positive um, kind of moral attributes for either. Um, implicitly, this is linked to a passage in the poem um, where they first see Ida sitting at a board with the two tame leopards catched beside the throne, or beauty compassed in a female form, the princess, liker to the inhabitant of some clear planet close upon the sun than our man's earth. So 
argue implicitly the passage being illustrated is this bit where Ida stands up from the desk with the lepers at her feet. And this very much establishes Ida. And this was picked up by the Morning Chronicle, the ideal figure of the princess herself, which opens the scene as series is a fine conception. She is high-souled, intellectual, spiritual, yet with a tinge of womanly softness. You see in her an index to the poet's idea and to the gentle romance that is to follow. The imagery of leopards, I think, is very interesting throughout the poem. Um, and um, I've just shown you the frontispiece where the leopards are, are with Ida. On the left, it's illustrating the passage. She stood among her maidens, higher by, higher by the head, her back against a pillar, her foot of one of those tame leopards, kippen like he rolled and pulled about her sandal. We could see this as a response to Coventry Patmore's response to the, the poem, claim that the leopards resemble lower powers of nature in just submission to the enlightened intellect. I got this from Linda Hughes' um, chapter I was reading earlier on today. Um, so there are suggestions that this kind of image of Ida with the leopards is a kind of talking about the kind of moral content, if you like, of of the poem. But I put in here just there aren't many illustrated editions of the princess, but on the right you can see Daniel McLeese's illustrated edition, 1859. You'll see a very, very different response to the same passage um, there. We've got Ida looking very, very different, and the leopards functioning in a very, very different way in the drawing. So I'm just coming towards the the, the close here. Um, there's quite a lot of reviews of this poem in the press, and they're you know very interesting. One thing they agree on is um, how Mrs. Lee's um, appropriated the poem in quite an individualistic way, but they're divided over whether to praise this or criticise the independence. So um, the the Morning Chronicle, I probably won't read all of this, but. Um, it is in having seized upon the positions and images which speak most eloquently of this pale, veiled passion of the poem, so as to give a romantic colour without resorting to a merely commonplace series of designs to express the action, that the chief merit of Mrs. Lace in this work consists. The story might almost be guessed without the explanatory fragments from the poem appended to each drawing. So saying, well, you can kind of get the idea even without the fragments of the poem. Um, Aponym, the subjects thus richly framed are outlines in the manner of wretch, though on a larger scale. There are in them much sweet and graceful sentiment and much energy in the more violent scenes, together with a strong feeling for the harmonies of composition. But they are sadly lacking in strict application to the text. The book must command attention as a most rich and elegant one, but the princess remains to be illustrated. So then, yeah, well, I like the images, but this isn't an illustrated version of the princess because there's not enough relationship between the images and the text. And the art journal, the princess affords extensive scope for the artist with its numerous picturesque scenes from which Mrs. Lees has gathered a few and worked them out with a boldness of composition and freedom of execution that not many, not even our men of mark could surpass. Their spirit and feeling thrown into the designs merit the highest praise we can bestow. And if she has not at all time caught the exact sentiment of the poet, the grace, vigour and beauty of her pencil go, go far to atone for the deficiency. So they all agree this is quite a selective, individual, idiosyncratic take on the poem. They are divided as to whether this is a good or bad thing. Now, in some ways, we can see this as part of a bigger debate. Um, should illustrators adhere closely to the literary text, or should they just use it as a taking off point for their own artistic creation? And this is really part of a power struggle between the illustrator and the author. Who's in charge? What sort of publication are we talking about? Um, and I think it's here we also need to understand this sort of criticism in the kind of context of the adoption of Tennyson as the national poet, you know, is someone allowed to do this to our poet laureate, which Tennyson is, of course, just by this stage. So, just to conclude, Illustrations to the Princess is an ambitious, sustained and individual, individualistic response to the poem. The format of the book sits chronologically between the literary album and the illustrated gift book, but was a luxury project 
product aimed at the Christmas market. Links between the Dickinson brothers and Tennyson may have facilitated the publication. And Lee chose to eliminate comedy and emphasise the romance plot while retaining the her heroic features of Ida's character. This is arguably a celebration of female power, but within the confines of a much more conventional kind of mar marital relationship. The style and manner of the illustrations show that Lise had training. She was certainly influenced by German Romanticism and arguably adopted a manner designed to engage readers' imaginative responses. The elaborate borders include a semantic scheme that supports Lise editorial and aesthetic decisions, and critical responses to the book underline this individual individualistic reading of the poem, but are ambivalent about the relationship between illustration and decoration. Overall, um, illustrations to the princess, I think, should be considered seriously in studies of the reception of the poem. This is an early response to the poem. It's by a woman. It's visualised. And I think it's something that could hopefully add to our understanding of this perplexing but but fascinating poem. Thank you. Mm -hmm.